Hey, what's up guys? It's Matt with The Movement System. Today we're going to talk about rate of force development and how that affects training. We're going to talk about low velocity versus high velocity training, max force versus max velocity or max rate of force development, and how we actually distinguish that and make training decisions. Let's go ahead and dive into it. All right, so this is the graph that we're gonna really use here to break down the difference between rate of force development and max force. This is our rate of force development graph, and let's just go ahead and break it down. What you'll see here, guys, is that there's a time axis here on the bottom. So this goes from zero seconds to half a second. And you can see here that the dotted lines actually represent different athletes. So again, time is on our x-axis, force is on our y-axis, and then the dotted lines are different athletes. So it specifically is showing how fast different athletes are producing force. So what you'll see is that black dotted line that jumps up quickly but then levels off fairly early, that is going to be our ballistic trained athlete, our basketball player who can dunk. This is our athlete who's done plyometric training, box jumps, depth jumps, power skips, dynamic effort lifts, drills with under speed and over speed, uh, sprinter, your classic sprinter, where you can see that they are actually producing more force in that shorter amount of time. If we look at some things like quick cuts or maneuverability, we're really looking somewhere in the middle of this graph, somewhere between 0.1 seconds and 0.4 seconds. If we're doing a true change of direction drill, like a 5-10-5 or something like that, where we're fully changing direction, that might be the movement where it takes you know 0.4 to 0.7 seconds. But for the most part, our quick athletic movements are lower on this graph. That's why we actually want to emphasize plyometric training and rate of force development in our athletes that need to perform at those high speeds and velocities. By contrast, that purple dash line that's less steeply sloped up, but has a higher point overall, that is gonna be our power lifter, for example. So they're able to actually produce more maximal force, but they have less rate of force development. We're gonna talk about this more in a second. And then that bottom line is just someone who's untrained. So they're low slope and they have low potential, low max strength as well. As you can see here, guys, the steeper that front part of the line, the faster that athletes can produce force. So if we compare the black dotted line to the purple dotted line, and we see how steep it is at the very early portion of that graph, that's where we're actually talking about rate of force development. So you can see that black dotted line is steeply sloped up. That athlete's producing a lot of force really quickly. Within that first 0.1 or 0.2 seconds, that athlete's producing more force than the power lifting athlete or the max force type trained athlete can produce in a short period of time. All right, so just to be really clear about this, let's think about athlete A and athlete B. Athlete A is our power lifter who just does one rep max, five rep max type training, high loads, low speed training all the time. That's athlete A. Athlete B is our basketball player. He doesn't really care how much he one rep max squat, he does a lot of plyometrics, a lot of dynamic effort lift with like 30% one rep max, just moving fast, uh, a lot of that type of training. So now let's compare athlete A and athlete B doing a box jump. So our power lifter is going to be able to produce more total force, but here's the thing, a box jump movement and actually jumping, it only gives you about maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds of ground contact time to produce that force. So we actually have to look at where this dotted line comes up from the x-axis here. And let's just say that 0.2 seconds is how long these athletes have to produce force. So now we can actually see that that power lifter here is gonna produce less force than that basketball player given the time constraint of only having 0.2 seconds to produce force. So in this case, guys, that basketball player is gonna be able to do a higher box jump because he can produce more force in that short period of time. Now let's do a one rep max squat where it's gonna take you know two, three seconds to get out of the hole and up in that squat. So now we're gonna look at the max force portion of this graph over here, and we can see that that power lifter trained athlete is going to have higher force when he has the full half a second plus to be able to produce that force. So how does this affect training decisions? We know that if we're working with a sprinter, in the acceleration phase of sprinting, whenever you're off the blocks, 
you're going to have anywhere from like 0.2 to 0.4 seconds of ground contact time on each foot contact. As you get faster and faster, that ground contact time is going to shorten all the way down to 0.09 to 0.12 seconds of ground contact time. What that means is that this athlete is going to have a really short amount of time to actually put force into the ground. So that sprinter, it's going to be really important that they have high rate of force development and that at this 0.1 seconds, that's where they're producing higher force than other athletes. So this is why the slope of this rate of force development is really important for sprinters. If you're finding this useful so far, guys, go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this. Now let's think about a cross country runner or an endurance athlete. These athletes actually do not need to produce high rates of force development. They actually need to produce sustained efforts. So in this case, our training decisions actually might be to do lower rate of force development activities. So while we might do a little bit of plyometrics just to introduce like the stretch shortening cycle and maybe get them used to the mechanics of you know accepting load and stuff like that, it's not really a primary adaptation for our cross country runners. It actually might be detrimental to do too much of the rate of force development activities because then they're gonna have more of a profile where they can produce force quickly and then dissipate force quickly. Whereas we want our cross country and our endurance athletes to actually have more of a profile where they produce force slowly and then maintain force longer. So those are the training decisions we're gonna make for that athlete. For our basketball player that just wants to have higher vertical jump, be able to dunk, be able to catch rebounds and really get up high, they're gonna do a lot of their training emphasizing rate of force development. They're gonna do box jumps, plyometrics, they're gonna do dynamic effort lifts, they're gonna do uh, med ball throws, they're gonna do all of these exercises that involve quick, forceful movements. So all of those movements are gonna emphasize adaptations that drive up this portion of the graph here, the rate of force development. Now, that said, we can't put all our eggs in one basket. They're still gonna to wanna to do some max effort type lifts, uh, and this could be dependent on the season as well. Potentially off season, they're working on, say, hypertrophy, and then preseason, maybe they work more into plyometrics, but maybe they spend longer on plyometrics preseason than, say, a football player might, whereas the football player might extend the hypertrophy, might extend the max effort phases of his training to develop more of a profile that has more of that high force type activity for those movements, if that's something that's a priority for him. So I actually did an Instagram post about this a little while ago. The big principle here, guys, is that most athletic movements occur too fast to produce maximal force. It takes about 0.6 to 0.8 seconds to produce maximal force. Now, most athletic movements we know are faster than that. We talked about max velocity sprinting being about 0.09 to 0.12 seconds. We know that change of direction drills are about 0.4 to up to 0.7 seconds. We know the acceleration phase of sprinting is around 0.2 seconds. So basically all these athletic movements are going so fast that rate of force development becomes a priority and we need to make training decisions that reflect that priority. All right guys, so long story short, don't train your athletes like power lifters. There's gonna be some aspects of that in their training throughout the year obviously, but we need to make sure we're emphasizing the right qualities to get the right results for our athletes. If you found this helpful, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. If you wanna learn more, go ahead and join the Strength and Conditioning Study Group on Facebook. If these videos have been helpful for you in studying for the CSCS exam, then you should check out my CSCS prep course. It's a comprehensive course that goes topic by topic through the CSCS material and prepares you for the exam. These are in-depth videos and they also have practice questions and notes along with it to help you prepare. If you wanna learn more, go ahead and click the link in the description below for more information about that. All right guys, we'll see you in the next one.